I had the opportunity three years ago to make a call on France that almost everyone disagreed with. People asked me what I thought would be the next big thing, and they were expecting a technology answer, and I said the next big thing will be France. Two and a half years ago, we got asked about France, why would you ever do business here? And we said France will become the startup nation all over Europe, growing faster in startups than any other major country in Europe. And here we are today, that has happened. Today, something has also changed. You can feel it. When you really think about France, I really mean this. You haven't seen anything yet in terms of what is about to happen to this country. France, in my opinion, will lead all of Europe in digital transformation and will lead all of Europe in terms of what's going to happen as the next generation European market evolves. There's nothing more exciting in this than talking to startups because you think about game changers. Job creation will largely come from the startups. It will largely be startups that start in the country and grow larger in terms of almost all the incremental job creation in companies. So today we have three great startups. Our goal is to make this really a learning opportunity for all of you. Uh, we're trying to put ourselves in your role in terms of what would we want to know. For Cisco, an aha moment was when we decided suddenly to move out of routing into switching. And a Ford and a Boeing said, bet on switching. And we did, and it's a $13 billion market today. An aha moment was walking into a session like this and realizing that voice will go over the internet and it will occupy just a small amount of the bandwidth that voice would be free. And calling that shot 10 years before people understood the implications of it. The aha moment for each of you. Benedict, maybe if you would start. What was your aha moment when you decided to form your company and, and what was unique about it or not? My aha moment was when I decided to change job. In fact, I have kind of a typical career path for French people, I guess. Math at university, then non-profit organization, and then consulting firm. And when I decided to change job, I felt stuck in stereotypes, you know, like gender, age, prestige of school, and I didn't know what I could do. So I found inspiration by analyzing, I guess, 500 resumes of people that were more or less similar to me. And I realized that HR people, which is their job to make people evolve every day and to recruit, they didn't do that. They didn't use external career path and data to make intrepid decisions. So I decided to launch a cluster with which is an automated uh, HR recommendation platform. And we are using artificial intelligence to, to kill that, to remove bias and human, well, human bias and stereotypes from HR data and delivering recommendation for career development and recruitment that will really surface people's domain potential as I needed. Tom, your, your background was different. You uh, were in an environment you found yourself in a new transition. Share with the audience what your aha moment was in terms of founding your company, and, and I love your candor in terms of how you got there. Sure, sure. So for me, it was, um, I also started, I, I like to say completely by mistake, right? I was broke, uh, my previous startup failed, and I wanted to continue being an entrepreneur, so I find myself together with my wife and two kids at the age of 35, Moving, moving back to my parents' house, living at the second floor of my parents' house. And we started doing this startup, which I didn't know will eventually become a big company. I had no intention at that stage to really build one. Yes. But we started working, the four of us, me and the three other co-founders, and I think the, a very important uh, point in my life, an aha moment, was we got the first offer to sell the company uh, seven months after we started operating. And it was for eighteen million dollars, one eight. Eighteen million. Yeah. So how many people in the room would have taken eighteen million for your return after <laughs> almost not having any money? By the way, me and too. sold the company. I, 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 when I look in retrospect, I have I, I really don't know what happened to us when we decided to say no to that offer. Now let me shortcut this. What is your valuation of your company today? It's north to a one billion. So he's a unicorn. 
I guess, yes. <laughs> but a red badge of courage in Silicon Valley style. Yes. You failed, you had the courage to risk everything and go again. Yeah, so for me that was a, an aha moment because that was the point in time where I really knew I'm going to take this all the way and build the biggest company I can possibly do. York, what was your aha moment? Well, I'm, uh, I was in drones all my life, so I did a drone company before. And, you know, commercial drones were on the rise. And, uh, of course, it was like drones coming everywhere, being in the, in the, in the living rooms and the construction sites. So when I found a D-drone, it was a drone crashed right in front of our chancellor's feet, Chancellor Merkel. She was giving a public speech, and a commercial drone landed literally next to her, like 20 centimeters away, and crashed there in front of her feet. That's when we started the company actually the same day, saying we have to do something for drone detection and drone prevention against malicious drones. Now, one of the things that you did very uniquely is you started in Germany, but then you s invested in Silicon Valley, but you kept your engineering team in Germany. So what was your thought process behind that? Because it is unique in both ways. You're growing very rapidly in Germany. You're growing very rapidly in the Silicon Valley. Yes, so we, did, uh, we started in Germany uh, in a very tiny little town, and we got some seed funding there. And we took all the money to move to the States. Uh, so we didn't invest much in product and strategy. We really took the money, went to the States, and went for another funding round over there. The beauty is having the engineering in Germany and the sales and marketing in the US, since it's a very strong combination. It's a very cheap combination, actually, so our balance sheet is pretty nice, since we do not spend almost, uh, we, we spend a very few uh, percentage only, what would we spend in Silicon Valley? But being in two continents, by definition, like having the majority of the people in Germany and in the US, means you have to have a very strong communications cu culture and a very strong company culture itself. And that's, the, that's a challenge. But the beauty is you get cheap engineering and perfect sales and marketing in the US. One of the challenges startups make the mistake of doing and why they fail is they don't have sustainable differentiation. So one of the teachings, if we're trying to share with the audience today, is what is your differentiation? Tomar, how is your product different than what your peers are, and how do you stay ahead? So originally for us, it was uh, uh, we, we started as being developers ourselves. So we knew firsthand what was the areas in which developers were struggling. It's easy to develop an initial product, but it's so hard to make that, pro that product a successful business. Yes. So we understood that, that the same problem that we were facing, everyone else was facing. And we started by, by developing this platform for our own internal needs, and then discovered that we can open the platform, give it to everyone, because everyone was suffering from the same problems that we were. And this is where the company really started uh, 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 rocketing. And for me, to be, to be ahead of everyone, is to constantly think about innovation. I often feel that in, in my area, in the internet area in general, many, many times it's more about innovation, how in innovative you are, than the pure algorithms or technology. You need to be innovative, and you need to be able to find it both in the company, incubated in the company, and also through m as to really identify who are the right targets and try to spot them earlier on and, and merge them into your company. How many companies have you acquired? Nine so far. Nine, yeah, nine, companies nine companies already. Yeah, nine companies. I, I very much believe that if you re and you, John, know it more than, than anyone else, right? If you, you've done more than 140, I think, acquisitions so About far. About 190. Yes, it's, it's to me, to, to be able to really hopefully build a huge company, you need to, to know how to grow the business both organically and non-organically. And, and the most important thing about, I think, about m as is to be able to develop the DNA in your company that will enable m as right? Because very often it's about the DNA, if you can really make them fit into your, your organization. And I think we were lucky enough to understand that part earlier on, because the first acquisition we did was, I think, a year after we were established. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to ask you lessons learned, uh, Benedict. But before I do, I'd like for somebody to turn on the clock. We don't have a counter uh, going on, so I don't know where I am in terms of timing. So if the uh, uh, crew could give me a, a clock so I could follow it, that'd be great. So to you. Lessons learned. Lessons learned. So if somebody's sitting out in the audience today and they're saying, out of your success, 
and you started here in France, and now you're thinking about going across Europe into the U.S. maybe next year. What's been your lessons learned? What's the one thing you're most proud of that's gone well, and what would be your one do-over? I think two things. First, um, what I learned is the fact that when you build and grow a company, it's not the same thing. So I had to learn how to go from a founder position to a CEO position because it doesn't require the same skills. You don't find motivation in the same things and you don't have the same behavior. And here it's like, well, it's a full roadmap to do that. And, and you need to have self-awareness so to find answers in the customer's needs, in your investor's needs and your team needs. So I think that, well, what I also proud of is the fact that at the beginning, I did a huge mistake about not realizing sooner that we were a team. So it means that I didn't really, I was not celebrating victories with the team and not sharing difficulties. But at the end, I think that, yes, it's important to be focused on business, to think about how we can move forward and we can be better. And at the end, it's important to have on the market a before and an after plus three. But what really matters is the fact that we take pleasure all together to build that, uh, that journey together. And then, well, the, the main challenge will be, of course, to recruit in the U.S. market and open the U.S. market because it's not the same culture than here in France, especially yes. for sales. They are really good at selling themselves. And then, well, when you work with them, sometimes they are not, well, so pluridisciplinary as you have in, uh, in French people. So, yes, adapting to the U.S. culture uh, with recruiting the right talents and growing a team that really can bring closer to the next level will be a, a huge challenge uh, for us, I guess. I would agree. Your, your lessons learned. Your, what, the, what was the most positive lesson learned and if you had a do-over? Yeah, um, so it's my third startup uh, and I did two security startups before and then my drone startup which have been sold successfully. The one lesson learned for me is certainly focus on sales. It's so easy to get, especially in San Francisco, distracted with fundraising rounds, with the next round and the biggest investors and so on. But the companies who focus on sales, and my firm belief is that every company has only two types of employees. It's either sales or sales support. I, I agree, I know we have disagreed because there's engineering and products and everything in it. But a company with a strong sales force will always succeed. So lessons learned for me is like emphasis on customers and customers and customer satisfaction only, and the, and the company will succeed. Tomer, one of the most important things, and I did not understand it as a CEO, when I became CEO, I understood my job was vision and strategy. I understood my job was the management team to implement the vision and strategy. I understood I was supposed to be the group communicator for the company internally and externally with customers. I didn't understand the importance of culture. You build a unique DNA into your company. How do you do that? And is culture really the fourth element that determines the success or not of a CEO? Oh, totally. I, if I had to choose the one thing that uh, personally for me is, mo is the most important role that I have in the company is to influence the culture, to really build the culture that is really ion source. And it's not something that you can, that you can uh, see elsewhere and say, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. It's like it has to really be who you really are. It has to be something that is very attached to who you really are personally. So, for instance, in Iron Souls, we have nine founders. We started the company four, and the founders of the companies that we've acquired, nine out of the ten, stayed with us. And everyone is fully vested, and everyone, there is, there is no reverse vesting or earnouts. Everyone gets everything at day one. So what brings everyone together, what makes everyone stick is the culture, is the trajectory and the alignment of interest of what we want to make, where we, where we want to go. And to me, that's the most important role. Of, uh, of the CEO and where I spend half of my time. Really creating the culture that we, that we will be winners, creating a culture that, uh, that endures uh, a bottom-up culture. It's not just me, the CEO, or my key uh, uh, managers dictating what the company is gonna do. Is we believe in diversification, different line of businesses, and very, very often it comes bottom-up. And that's, that's a culture that I love in Iron Souls, and a culture of go and do. And, and I, by the way, I, I connect to what York said earlier. We have been profitable since day one. Since, I think, three months after we started operating, we became profitable. And to me, that's part of the DNA. Because we, some, very often when I speak to entrepreneurs and I talk about their startups, so they have a vision. They know what they want to do. But to me, it's like binary. They say, hey, I want to do this. And basically what I'm, they're saying is, if I'll be successful, someone will acquire me. 
And that to me is a wrong DNA for islanders. The, the right DNA for us is we build a business, a real business that has to grow and has to be profitable and has to diversify. And I think that's part of our culture and our DNA. So for the VCs in the room or listening to this uh, tape later on, these are three companies that are the exception. Normally what you see in Europe or in Silicon Valley is companies who are on their seventh or eighth round of financing and they've raised hundreds of millions of dollars. Each of you have tremendous momentum at this time, yet you've been pretty frugal. Benedict, how much have you invested? How much do you have invested in the company? And what's your attitude toward, toward the funding? And, and it's different than what I've seen with most other startups. Yeah, and in fact, I, I launched Class 3 alone, so I, I was a sole founder. So I think that it was for me important to have funding since day one because, well, I sold a product to a company without having it at the beginning, so I had like maybe 150K to recruit a team and grow the team, but I realized that it was not enough to really make the difference. So then I had to do, well, a pre-seed round of 600K to build an R&D team and, and, and make the product and have the product live. And then two other fundraising of 2.5 million and 7 million to really build the commercial team and bring Cluster3 to the market. And I think that the, the main focus here is how I can recruit and grow a team and attract A players uh, and, and, be, and become, in fact, like a, an orchestra conductor to recruit people that are better than me in their specificity, so in marketing, in sales, and have that team of people that can bring Cluster3 to the next level. Same for investors and business angel, not having only money, but having lots of skills that you can leverage when you're a sole founder and you want to build, as we say, like a company and not, well, raising money for then selling the company quite, uh, quite soon. York, your thoughts on this in terms of how you focused and how little money you've raised yet the success of your company? Because this is truly different. If you're in Silicon Valley and you're talking to almost any three startup groups that have been successful as you are, they've raised a lot more money and they've spent a lot more money and most of them aren't clo close to profitability, yet all three of you are. How did you build this into your company? Well, we, we raised only what we needed to have. So it kind of, I, I'm really not a fan of raising huge amounts of capital because it distracts the management, it distracts the whole company. Also the message is wrong. You may deploy EAs, like executive assistants, and you have like all these things large organizations have. But what you really need is the amount of money you need to hire sales and get the first level of customer traction. And once you fulfill the business plan that way, then you can go for another smaller round, uh, so which, which allows you to grow the company and to live up to that expectation. So we raised in total like 28 million so far uh, in three different steps. We started with a seed, Series A and Series B. And we use it mainly to build our marketing and sales force to, 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 to gain customers, to win customers. Uh, so you won't see any unnecessary items of that. And again, if you, if you focus your company on sales, there will be many problems you don't have, like politics, uh, you, people won't leave, you, know, you won't spend money on recruiters because you can recruit just by the, the network you are building and the people would love to bring their colleagues and everything would like to be part of their success. So what we are doing is a strong company culture. We party a lot. We, we, we really go drinking also a lot. But also we extremely focus every single one on sales. Also the CFO, when he goes and talks to the bank, he brings home the business card from the security responsible guy saying, this is your next lead, Mr. Mr. Sales Guy. And I think that's key for an organization. So again, for Grace, what you need. I, I, I bet on uh, France very hard two and a half years ago and then a year and a half. I have a strong reason why I think this will become not just a startup nation, but you haven't seen anything yet versus France's ability to literally lead the entire of Europe uh, in terms of a digital transition and then actually a total transition. Why were you successful in France? What has changed now versus perhaps what many people around the world listening to this are saying, why should I invest in France? Why would a startup be successful here? What's different? I think young people's mindsets change. In fact, I think that now professional lives have become an extension of their personal lives. And young people are searching for meaning and also for intensity. And they know that now that they can have an impact on, on what they do, they can have an impact regarding 
the way they, they do their conception and where they work. And it's easier to have a strong impact when you're working on a startup or launching a startup because the, the path between your action and the impact on the market is shorter. So before, when you wanted to be engaged, maybe you, you, you will have done like political stuff or working in government. I think that now when people want to solve problems, they are launching companies. And the second thing is, for a long time, French people, they have been complexed by having ambition and telling that they have ambition. I think that now we know that we have the resources, the talents, uh, the energy and the passion to make things and to build things that really have an impact and matters. And now we are not complex anymore about sharing that ambition. And I think that investors saw that because now you have Nordics investors, investors from the UK that really want to invest in, in French people because there is the talents and now there is also the ambition. So I teased about a year and a half ago about for the venture capitalists you should be investing now in France. You're saying you believe this is the future, it's only going to get better. Yes. I do too, by the way. If there's one country you bet on in startups in Europe, this would be the place. And this is a country that gets it from the government level, uh, from Macron all the way through, in terms of the changes that have to occur. Let's reverse roles. Part of what I do is I love to teach and share views. You all get a chance to be the moderator now. Uh, any question within reasonability uh, is fair game. Uh, lightning round for me. What what questions would you like to ask me? Can can I start? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm I'm very intrigued. I'm sure we can all learn from it. When you think you you've, you've done a, a very long, huge, amazing career at Cisco, and when you think about transitioning to what you're going to do next, how you what is it? What would what would, what excites you? How would you decide what you do and what you don't do? How you would f how you think about what what to focus on? If we can learn from that. Well, one of the things I've always done at Cisco, I never make the first move on the chessboard. I played the game all the way to the end, backwards, forwards, all the wise. And so as I made a decision about five years ago to transition to our new CEO, and I made the decision literally three years before I even shared it with the board, uh, I knew what I wanted to do in my next life. In my next life, I wanted to literally be part of startups and really rapid growth, and I wanted to be a coach I enjoy being a role model, help the startups learn, because I've seen the, every movie there is to see, good and bad. I've made the mistakes and the successes. And to share that with a company and then watch almost like, not your children, but like your, your, your peers younger, really watch you all be successful. I mean, that's what really excites me, and that's what I decided to do. And you still feel like the energy and the passion to really do something that will change the world, or you mean you, you are mainly focused on helping us, like like the like entrepreneurs and CEOs become better. You, there are areas where you think, hey, this is something, an area, not just an entrepreneur, that really gets me excited because I think this could have a huge impact on, on the world or, or humanity. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Cisco was founded, and when I started uh, at Cisco with only 70 million in sales, Within a year, I said, we will change the way the world works, lives, learns, and plays. It's important as CEOs to outline your vision and strategy, where you're going to go, to bring the excitement and the energy to do it, then how do you execute off of it? So for me, all the areas I'm involved in, I think, are next generation market transition companies that have caught an inflection point. The drone industry, both offensive drones in terms of how do you use it in insurance and how do you use it mm -hmm. in construction to do the Internet of Things and yeah. digitize. From a defensive perspective, along with every good capability, there will be people that misuse this. And what York did there is what attracted me to his company, and I'm an investor there. I'm also an investor in areas such as social media with companies like Sprinkler mm -hmm. that do the, do the mining of all the media capabilities, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and are able to get businesses to focus on touching those customers before they even bring it back. I'm in three security companies because I believe security is, mm -hmm. is the future, not that we'll compete with Cisco, but separate. And then I'm in an area called uh, robotic Internet of Things cricket farming. And if you want to have an effect on the environment, which I really believe we all do, the most effect you can have on the environment isn't what car you drive, isn't how you have energy in your home, it's the protein on your plate. And you will see crickets that are really with Internet of Things and measurement will become one of the key staples on a global basis, I believe, as we go forward. And it's one-seventh the impact on the environment. So those are the type of things Amazing. that I dream in. Thank you. 
Well, we, we all know that building a company is being resilient, uh, not being afraid of, of failure, and always moving forward, but sometimes we have to give up on, on things. Yes. So my question will be, when did you give up on something? You know, at first, uh, I hesitate, and then I realize I have a couple times. I think it's very important as a CEO of a startup or a larger company that when your strategy is not going to play out and you've either missed the market or somebody's not executed you, you have to say, I've got to change directions and you have to do it very quickly. I did that, uh, I've acquired 190 companies, I've acquired uh, 20 of them over a billion dollars in acquisition costs, but I acquired a flip camera for 600 million it was the hottest camcorder imaginable. Steve Jobs got up on stage and said, this is a great product. My team said, isn't that good? And I said, no, watch what comes next. He said, I'm gonna give that to you for free. <laughs> and I closed the company within six months and wrote down 600 million. To the other part, however, and I think this is important, Shimon Perez, who we'll be honoring later, uh, was one of the most creative innovators I've ever met in my life. I've known him for 17 years. He was like an extended family for me personally. But he taught you it always looks darkest just before victory. He teaches you leadership is lonely, especially when things are tough. And so in Cisco, we build a culture that if we listen to our customers, we delivered what they said, we never give up. And our competitors, when they get beat, pack the bags and go home, our sales force set a minor objection we're going to win from there. And so I think that combination of being realistic when you're winning and you've got a winning strategy versus you missed and you have to do it differently, it is so important not to give up easy. If the CEO shows you're giving up, your whole company's in trouble. You aren't to you. Yeah, my biggest question would be, and also for the audience, um, you've seen millions of CEOs probably, or thousands at least. What's the most likely, the one or two mistakes most likely the CEOs will make in the, in the startup environment? You know, usually uh, people ask what's going to make me successful as a startup CEO, but I like your question better. Um, the mistakes are classical, and I know there are two or three VCs in the room that I know and probably more. The first mistake a startup will make is they will miss a market transition. And if you're not in a market transition where things are different and you're going into a crowded market already, your chances of success are almost zero. The second mistake is the CEO will not focus in on how do they meet the needs of their customers and how am I different than players already there. If you don't have sustained differentiation and costly evolving differentiation, uh, that will uh, get you into trouble. The third thing, and I see it regularly in the startups I'm involved in, for those that aren't been bought by Cisco but are outgrowing, if you're an engineering background, the mistake the CEO will normally make is they are not good at creating the right sales leads. They say, why should I pay a sales lead more than I'm getting paid as CEO? The answer is because a good sales lead will cost you that much. But they don't know how to judge what that person is, how they understand distribution, et cetera. The reverse is true. If you have a CEO of a company who's largely a very strong business background, perhaps legal background, marketing, uh, sales background, they almost always struggle with a legal, I'm sorry, with engineering. They don't know how to recruit the right engineering talent. They don't know how to uh, focus on is the product on scale or not. So what gets the CEO in trouble in that area is if they have expertise in one area, they don't understand how to recruit the other. The last element is that as a young startup CEO, you will be, and I am loyal, I follow every illness of every employee in our company that's life-threatening and we're there for them, but you'll make the mistake of having on your management team people who helped you found the company, who work hard, who you love, yeah. and they cannot scale anymore. And you will keep them there too long thinking you owe that to them loyalty-wise, where the rest of the company is looking at you saying you've got a problem. That person's slowing us down from being successful, and that's a problem for you as CEO. So those are probably five of the areas that I would hit. Let's return to each of you. If you were looking at this audience and saying, there's one message I'd like for you to have, either about startups in Europe, about startups in general, about startups in France, or lessons learned, or a key message for the audience. Tomer, what would it be? 
I would go with uh, know what you really want to do. It's so hard to build a company. It's so, so hard and the road is so long and so painful. You really need to know if you really want to do this. Yes. And if you really want to do this, be truthful to yourself. If you, you know, I've never met an entrepreneur that told me, you know, we see a lot of deal flows, that told me, hey, what I want to do is I want to build a small company. They all say, we all say we want to build big companies, but very few of us do it. And now it's not because you're lying to, to the investor or to whoever you're talking, it's because you don't really know if you really have it in you to really build a big company or you will sell uh, when, when they first offer you a big check. So it's okay, it's okay to sell early and it's okay to build it for a long run, but you need to be prepared, know what you really want to do. For me, it's, it's been one of the amazing experiences in my life to build Iron Cells the way we, we did it. And I think having, taking that advantage of knowing what you really want and use that, that, that trajectory, that experience you have in the company to really become also a better person to know what you want to do, what's good for you, what's not good for you, and really go with your dream. But know it early on. What is it that you really want to do? Don't do it because you think you'll make a lot of money out of it. That's not a good reason. I completely agree. Benedict, your thoughts for the audience. I think it will be the fact that you don't have to launch a startup to be fashionable. You have to launch a company if there is a real problem you want to solve, and it's a no-brainer for you because it will require a lot of energy, it will be difficult sometimes, it will be amazing sometimes, and you really need to focus on this is a problem I want to solve and I deeply want to solve it. And then we'll recruit the right team and, 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 and do the right things that help you to, to get there. And even if you're alone and you have a lot of people saying that it is impossible, in fact, if you really want to solve that problem, you will find the resources to make it possible, like being a sole founder, launching a company, raising funds without having product or having a team. It seems impossible, but, but, but we made it at the end. And I think that whatever we did, uh, whoever we are, whatever our mission and our dreams are, we all have the potential to do something. We just need to accept it and then turn it into really like uh, not a weakness, but something that will make you stronger at the end. I would agree. Jordan? I think the, uh, one of the biggest mistakes founders make, one of the biggest learnings is how you plan your organization. I'll give me an example. Every entrepreneur dreams of being acquired by Cisco, right? But it's the wrong, it's, 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 it's a very wrong mistake to do because when you start planning your enterprise for being acquired, you're doing the wrong things. Let's say in the beginning you drive your ERP system, you maybe have QuickBooks or something, or Excel. But at a certain moment, you would need to upgrade to Oracle or something more professional. But you would not do it if you want to be acquired. That means you hinder your company in growing and you hinder your company in really doing what it really can do, you know, like customer satisfaction. So don't plan for an acquisition and just go full swing to grow a sustainable, large, profitable company. You know, I'd like to close the panel by being very candid about what I see the opportunities in France. I said literally a year and a half ago, France would become the startup nation. Two years ago, the next big thing would be France. And at the opening of this conversation, I said you haven't seen anything yet in terms of what's gonna happen in this country. France will, in my opinion, lead all of Europe in this digital transformation. France will translate the startup mentalities with their large companies, with inclusive capabilities for a digital France, with the leadership and government that can really bring this home in a way that will be a model for the rest of the world. And I think the transformation will not just be digital, it will be a transformation for the next generation in Europe. You see that taking place, and you suddenly see big companies working with other big companies, often French companies with American, with startup together and focused on solutions. You see a country that is really dreaming again. You see a media that's normally critical suddenly being very supportive. So the next best thing, next biggest thing, will be France, a France of the future. I want to thank you, Jörg. I want to thank you, Benedict. I want to thank you, Tomer. Thank you, John. Really enjoyed thank it. You, John. Thank you, Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you all. Thank you. No, no, no. Go. What's what?